Hello, Anthony. Hello, Claudine. Hello, we're, Robert. We're joined today by Hello. one yes. of my favorite guests, attorney Robert yes. V. Hansen. Yes. The V is for victory. <laughs> today yes. we want to talk about an IRS streamlined OVDP litigation update, and yeah. I know you have a lot of opinions. I have a lot of opinions. I do. Uh, and, uh, really? Yeah. Well, you do, too. I do. You know, you do, too. Because, we're, you know, this is this case that's going on right now, um, it's a maze and two other plaintiffs versus the IRS. It's some of the same things that we do. And it's really mm -hmm. a great uh, example of, it shows all the frustrations that we have with the offshore disclosure process, how things really happen, and really sort of, to me, just really twist the knife and sort of the unfairness and really bad policy the IRS is setting here and just some of the crazy things they do. So who are the plaintiffs? Well, we have... Let's see. What's her first name? Eva. Just, Eva May. Yes, Eva May. She is ninety-seven years old right now. Criminal. Sounds like it. Ninety or no, ninety-five. I'm sorry, Eva, if you're watching Very this. I'm sorry. Suspect. Ninety. Right. So uh, she was born in Romania, and fled um, b during the Nazi occupation, um, and so she had some uh, funds in uh, overseas. Mm -hmm. Just left it there. Didn't really think too much about it. So she learned about that she was in non-compliance, and uh, with the threat of penalties, she entered into the 2012 Offshore Voluntary Disclosure Program, mm -hmm. um, and she was going to pay a 27.5% penalty, which was crazy, but with the threat the IRS was throwing out there, we'll hit you with a 50% penalty, and then we can add more if we want to. Right. She really, you know, there, there is a gun to your head, basically, at this point. Um, so later on, though, the IRS comes along and says, oh, you know what? We've been a little bit harsh in a, a lot of these harsh. cases. A little, we might have gone a little bit too far because we're not getting a lot of people coming forward. Um, so they relax the rules to say, all right, you don't need to do this whole big thing. If you're going to say you're non-willful, we'll just sort of take your word for it. Just pay us a 5% penalty and, and we'll be done with it. So the IRS created the transitional rules to make a process for people who entered into the, the full offshore volunteer disclosure program right. to get this transitional treatment. Right. Um, and it's something that we've done for a lot of our clients. Now, Robert, did 100% of our clients get accepted for transitional treatment? Nope. No. No. It's a, as, as much as that pains me for some of them, some of them in particular, yeah, the, what, they've, what they noted here in the article, what they noted here in the case, transitions are hard, are hard to get. You've got to fight for them. Yeah. It's, it's a crazy, it's, it's an insane level to prove that you are non-willful in the transitional request. And it's a harder standard than if you were opting out. And, you know, here is someone who's clearly, uh, Mrs. Mays, is clearly non-willful in every sort of way. And here's some revenue, revenue agent, and that's really what it is. It's really yeah. a revenue agent and their boss. You really don't know who's making the determination. They're just saying, no, no, you knew what you were doing, lady. We're going to whack you. I'm not going to let you in now. I'm not going to let you off. You're going to pay that big penalty. Or, or, and this is what the IRS does, hey, look, if you don't like this decision, you always could opt out, um, which is its own okay, sort of... Okay, so now you're gambling with your retirement. Everything, right. Because if you opt out, now you could be subject to just... You know, you, could, you could be get penalties that you can never you, you pay for. So if you're retired, right. you say you're 95 years old. Um, Let's this, say you need that money. Say you need that money because you have to be... And, and that... Getting a job uh, to pay for your care isn't much of an option. Walmart Greeter really doesn't probably but cover it. It's not going to really cover your, your living expenses uh, so much. Um, it's really like, yeah, I, I really was attached to this money all these years. Um, so it's frightening you to death. So you're sort of saying, no, I, I have to get this transitional. I mean, the 5% penalty is nonsense. That's way too much. That's ridiculous that people in Mrs. May's situation and uh, her fellow pa plaintiffs have to pay anything for something um, that, by the way, they're the ones who came to the IRS. The IRS right. didn't find them. Right. They're the ones who came to the IRS, and the IRS is, is, is treating them like criminals because you're saying, wait, wait a second. So, so essentially, with your... With your with the revenue agent's determination that she was not non-willful, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You're basically saying she's a criminal, essentially, because well, she should have known about it. She had a, she sort of had some sort of, some sort of deception was was taking place. So now this brings us to the litigation. Yes. But you're both saying you think they have a very difficult time of winning. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Opinion? Yeah. Yeah. Real, real bad. I think I understand a hundred percent why. Sure. They're bringing this case. They're bringing it because 
they can't gamble on that opt out. Mm -hmm. And so many times we've had clients contact us. We'll say, look, based on what we see, you're as much of a slam dunk opt out as we've ever seen. Then they ask us, can you give us a guarantee? Nope. No, we cannot. Uh, every opt out we've done, uh, we have succeeded on, but I would imagine there's one we won't. I don't know which one that's going to be. We happen to do a lot more than probably anybody else. It's something we really enjoy doing because of the, the stakes. But you can imagine if you're really risk averse, you're going to go through. By the way, you've got you to you gotta pay us a lot of money to do that. Opt out audit is no joke. You have to no. go through all the the um, uh, you have to go through all of the uh, the taxes, and then your yep. your your opt out exam of the F bar. That's you've gone to some pretty elaborate proceedings on that. Yeah, I um, I've had ones that are in person that are under oath. You know, done in an IRS office. I've done ones that are over the phone. But either way, this is going to be a situation where in an opt-out audit, in an FBAR audit really, the auditor is going to speak with the person because they're trying to uh, assess the state of mind of that person at the time of, of the FBAR violation. So when I do these with people, I spend a lot of time ahead of, before we get to the actual interview itself. I, I go over their facts, I then push them, I then push them even harder, I try to ask them the questions, how I think that, that they're going to sound, and there's always something that they don't think to bring up to me in our conversations that might even get brought up during, during the interview itself. Mm -hmm. So, you know, w g g to your point, one of the reasons why these things can, can, can be so costly is because it's going to be a lot of time with your attorney to make sure when we get to the actual interview itself, you aren't going to say anything that I am not expecting. Yeah. And it's really hard. One of our sayings around here is we have a difficult time getting people to tell the truth. And so many times they'll, they'll blurt out something that, why did you say that? That's not even close to the truth because it's the pressure of this yeah. audit. And um, it's really, it is very much like uh, being uh, questioned by the police. And police mm -hmm. get, uh, are able to compel false confessions all the time, yep. the entire scene. So, you know, our job is to make sure, like, look, this is what they're going to be doing. They are looking to hang you. Yep. And they, now you said something interesting here too. Even if the plaintiffs plaintiffs win, they can still lose. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So let's just say so let's just say they got the relief. Yep. That the plaintiffs uh the Susan Batra uh and she was born in India like 40% of our clients. Um and she she um her and her husband moved money after the 1985 savings and loans crisis to the US because uh, hey, look, it looks like the IRA, you know, the, the, the U.S. Uh, banking system has some issues. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a pretty legitimate uh, reason. And then there's uh, Mrs. Lichtenstein. Uh, she was born, born in Berlin, Germany in 1924. Um, and uh, she was, uh, you know, this is a common fact, too. Um, there was something going on in Germany at the time um, against Jewish people. There was some sort of thing um, Might have heard of it. And right, there's, there's a many, many uh, Holocaust survivors who have gotten wrapped up in this. Um, it's really common for it, and they get absolutely no quarter. Because um, the IRS is like, well, we, we're giving you a deal on this. We're allowing you to pay a 27.5% penalty on something that if we did find you, we could assess we a could 50, we could assess you a fifty percent fifty percent penalty. So which, that's which we know we would do because you're clearly a tax evader, right? Because so you're we're giving you a deal here. Right. That's not you know you're this is clearly this is the, a gift. You right. better take this and run. Right. Well, there's there's sort of the absurdity of this. The F bar, the penalty, is nothing to do with tax evasion, but the IRS is taking it and applying it as a tax evasion penalty when it doesn't you don't need your accountant doesn't need to make money to get a willful F bar penalty. Mm -hmm. The F bar is part of the Bank Secrecy Act. It's supposed to uh, crack down on international terrorism, but now it's used to create terrorism of U.S. people with these threats. I see what you did there. It's, yeah, I know. I was, I was going to say that for the end, but I was like, you know, here's my opening for that. Um, so this is, this is the, the, these FBAR audits are insane. Now, here's the other thing, and this is the other thing about it. If you look at the landscape. So to, to answer your question right now, though, even if they win, they lose. Why? Because the IRS could still audit them. Yep. We'll give you tr we'll give you the streamlined transition you want. Sure, sure. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Can hey, we just take a look at your right. all your financials? Just everything. Because the difference between the OVDP and the streamlined is the OVDP. There's a closing agreement. That's that's really the final. Oh, thing. okay. 
in your streamline, it's like, hey, we're going to be auditing some. So, hey, you know, you file what you want. We'll just select a few for audit. We're not going to tell you which ones they are. Mm -hmm. So they could just say, you know what? You know what, Mrs. Lichtenstein? Well, you know it. Your streamlined submission was selected for audit. Now you're in the exact same position as someone who's going through an OVDP opt-out. Okay, so now what the IRS is looking at, and this is what the IRS loves, they, you know, and, and all of these agents love to claim the law means something it is. There's two cases they cite routinely. Mm. Which ones are those, Robert? Williams and McBride. Williams and McBride. What would you say is a huge fact, President Williams and McBride, that isn't present in somebody that made an offshore voluntary disclosure? Uh, <laughs> the non-voluntary part of, uh, there, of that? That sentence, yeah, there that you sentence go, right. generally, yeah. not um, uh, these people didn't come forward through a, a disclosure program. And That's the IRS had to come to them. For well, a, well, a variety. Of Williams reasons. did come forward in a plea agreement of criminal tax evasion, but that was it wasn't a, an offshore program. So the IRS takes Williams and McBride to say, "Oh, these things mean that we're going to be able to assess everybody penalties," but those the two big facts like those are people you guys caught, you caught them. These ha don't apply in situations where s someone's coming forward. That's a huge fact that you guys just sort of completely ignore. Not even there. You go right to, it's like, well, they did file their F-bars. Mm -hmm. Excuse yep. me. They did file their F-bars. Did they file it on time? No. Just says that they did file it. So failure to file, well, you're implying that w w they didn't file. Yes, they did. Just not on time. So shouldn't that matter? Shouldn't that matter for something? Then I think the second part is... What were what was the purpose in not filing? Did it have anything to do with the purpose of the Bank Secrecy Act? Are these people criminals? Are these people terrorists? Why is this not the issue? And we try to, you know, we point this out. By the way, this is not the people you're trying to go after. Mm -hmm. um, so let's think about really how we should apply this. Well, I think when you look at, I've se I've seen how the IRS decided. Williams and McBride. It's always in a blurb. It always gets to the, gets to the punchline. They don't even cite it correctly for what it really is holding. Uh, thank God. Yeah. Uh, but it doesn't. It, it doesn't give you the facts. It doesn't. It, they yeah. don't. They don't give you the facts. They don't get, like. They leave. Oh, by the way, you know, uh, Williams Williams pled guilty to criminal tax evasion and then had a signed statement saying that he was aware of his FBAR filing requirement and then didn't do it on purpose. I don't have that for any of my clients. And yet my clients are nervous, like all get out, that they're going to be assessed a yeah. willful penalty because, you know what, the IRS kind of wants to assess them a willful they, penalty. They, they want, they're, they're, they're going for it. They're going for it. And really the, the relevant law on this, Robert, is, is a Supreme Court case. What's the name of that Supreme Court case? Uh, Ratzloff. Ratzloff. Right. Ratzloff gives the standard for willful Bank Secrecy Act penalties. And it's really not anything what the IRS is, is claiming it yep. is. Uh, that Ratzloff requires a specific intent. Yep. Uh, that is, you had to really ma not want to file this. Um, so an example I would get is, so, so let's just say uh, you knew 100% about an FBAR. You, you knew, oh, yeah, I have an FBAR obligation. It's going to be due June 30th. Now it's due with your tax return. Oh, yeah, know all about it. I know exactly what needs to be reported. And... There it is. That, that, that's a fact we can establish 100%. Yet you didn't file one. Mm -hmm. Should you be assessed willful FBAR penalties based on that fact alone? Well, what was your intent? I forgot. Okay, well then, I think if we're going according to what the law says at the Supreme Court, yeah. it would be no, uh, that you can't show willfulness on that one. Right, because you didn't specifically intend not to file it. So yes, you have knowledge of it, but you didn't intend not to file it. You just forgot. Now, in the case where... I thought uh, it was filed. Same thing. I, I thought it was. Oh, I gave it to someone else to file. That is not the specific thing. Now, and this is where things sort of get perverted. The law gets completely perverted. You see this a million times. The IRS has this mechanism because, well, nobody really knows about the FBAR because it's so convoluted. So we're like, well, that, that's too high of a standard to meet. Um, and we really can't go into someone's brain to say, did you really know that this form existed? So they always go to this willful blindness standard. You willfully, blindly didn't learn about the FBAR. And now they sort of take that, that willfully blindness, and apply that to the intent part, too, so that you can have someone who didn't know about the FBAR, should have, um, and didn't file it. Well, who, who's to say that they, they intended not to file it 
if they knew about it. So they're able to, to sort of pervert this whole thing, and that's really the holding. So um, there's going to be now who the, who wants to be the guinea pig on this? Because there is the the, the Supreme Court precedent, the Title Thirty One, <laughs> which isn't adequately addressed by either the Williams or McBride right. cases. Williams not at all; doesn't even yeah. mention it. Yeah. And McBride mentions it, cites it for some like kind of passing purpose. Yeah. As, oh yeah, Rasloff said this, or uh, or or. Uh, the Supreme Court has said X, Y, and Z, C, Ratchloff, in the one or two other cases for something similar, and then just moves on. Yeah. It doesn't address the substantive holding itself, not truly. So I think, I would say in closing, Anthony, your statement here, everyone who has money or intends to have money should be concerned. Yeah. It's this pretty is, telling. This is, what, this is what this is really about, is unfortunately, so many people don't think the IRS is a threat until this happens, something like this happens, mm -hmm. where you, you say, you've got to be kidding me. You're, you're going to really put, you're going to put an old lady out on the street who did nothing wrong. She made a s simple mistake. People make mistakes with the tax code all the time. I guarantee everybody in Congress who writes this, I can find, we represent IRS employees, okay? Everybody makes, sense, makes mistakes with the most complicated thing in the history of history. Yep. So, you're, you know, that the IRS gets away with things so many times because people, how do you, how do you litigate this? Uh, with an opt-out, when is your fortunes on the line? For the IRS employee, their pension's getting paid. Their pay's going to come in fine. So they're fine. Oh, no, we're, we're, we got to enforce the law. But just think about, I think, how absolutely creepy all of this is. This is so creepy. What they're doing is you're finding targets who are so vulnerable, they're rolling over for you. Is that what you want your legacy to be? Is that what you want it to be? Uh, my opinion of the IRS has, has I think, be, you know, become more in line to what it is. I, I look at it as uh, we are not, we are, we live in an occupied country. There's the U.S. government and there's the IRS. They're the ones really in charge because all of this stuff, as they go up and beat up on people, people don't know what they're doing. Uh, people aren't, they're allowed to get away with everything mm -hmm. because they're not hitting everybody. So that's what's got to change that, yeah, if you ever think you're going to make money, if you ever think you're going to have money, and uh, maybe if you don't have money, there's a reason why, too. You don't know. You don't, there could have been an opportunity you had, but the person who was going to be your customer just got wiped out by the IRS. So that's something you're never going to know. Mm -hmm. um, they are out there, um, and they really are. They're very polite, very nice, nice people, very nice people. Uh, you know, generally, they're very nice people, very orderly. But they are dead set against you, and they want to ruin you, and they're completely fine with it. And it's not about fairness. It's about whether the IRS can do it, because in their mind, if they can do it, they will do it. They will do it, and that's fair. All right. Well, Robert, thanks for joining us today. Sure thing. If you have any issues that you need assistance with, any offshore um, disclosures you're unsure of, just contact us for a consultation, info at irsmedic.com. We've got a great blog on irsmedic.com with a lot more information. You can like and comment below and subscribe to our channel so you get more awesome tax updates. Thanks for watching.